Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. My name is David Andrew. I'm head of the Department of Fine Arts at the Witt School of Arts, and I'm going to be chairing this session this afternoon. So it's my, my task to introduce the session, to introduce three colleagues who will be speaking to you, and then to facilitate the discussion across the next hour. So thanks very much for joining us and welcome again. Thanks too to Aisha and Lauren for inviting us all to be part of the session. Thanks to the Turbine Art Fair and uh, special thanks for making uh, arts education part of this online art fair. Thanks too to Ryan for being behind the scenes and organizing everything. So I'm going to start off by just giving everyone a sense of the format for the hour that we have together. Um, I'm going to spend a few minutes introducing uh, the session and the colleagues. It'll probably take between five and ten minutes. Each panelist is then going to have seven minutes to speak. And uh, that should take us just past half past. They'll then have an opportunity to ask each other questions or just to clarify or expand on things they've said. And then we're going to open the discussion up to the audience for the remainder of the session. And then towards five o'clock, I'll just close the, the session. So the title of the session today is Education, Art, Art Education Across South Africa. What we've tried to do is we've tried to emphasize education in art. And if we go beyond South Africa and go beyond the south, uh, borders of South Africa, um, all well and good. Um, I'm sure that Simon Gile will uh, help us do that. Um, I don't think you can expect a comprehensive overview of uh, education and art, art education across South Africa this afternoon. But I think that what will happen, we'll hear three stories, perhaps, a set of experiences that illuminate education and art, that give us some sense of uh, experiences from the panelists. So the three panelists are people that I respect enormously. I've worked with all of them. Uh, in one way or another over a number of years. Um, and I think the reason that I've invited them to be part of the session is because they, they have an appreciation of coming from a particular, particular disciplinary area, but at the same time, they work in a very intern cross-disciplinary way. And in that sense, I don't think they're located very specifically in one discipline. Um, and hopefully that will come through in the discussion that takes place. Uh, I also think that they have experiences in formal arts education and education more broadly, but also in non-formal and informal arts education. So that, that is the, the format that gives you some background to the session itself. Um, I'm going to introduce the three panelists very briefly, and then we're going to go straight into their presentations. Many of you will know the, the panelists, um, and uh, Mulemo, Sibongele, and Puleng. If there are things that I don't say in the introductions, please, uh, by all means, add. I'm sure you'll do that in your uh, presentations. So let me start with uh, Mulemo. Um, Many of you will know Mulemo as uh, the former director of VANSA, the Visual Arts Network of South Africa. Um, she's obviously moved on to do other things since then, but uh, she did her fine arts degree at the Witt School of Arts, and she followed that up with an MA in Social Anthropology. Um, she's also part of an artist's collaborative called Made You Look with uh, Nare Makoto. Um, and in the uh, this collective, 
they explore everyday popular imaginaries and modalities for knowledge. And it's one of the reasons why I thought it would be interesting to have Mulema on the, uh, the panel today. Mulema has also um, won a number of awards. Um, she's also worked at the Market Photo Workshop as a manager of public programs. She's done sessional teaching in both history of art and social anthropology at Slitz University. And uh, she's also been involved in a number of uh, areas with regards to consultancy. Um, she did a lot of freelancing in arts and research um, in Johannesburg, particularly, but further afield. And uh, one of the most recent um, opportunities that I had to hear her speak was uh, early this year in January when she spoke at the Arts Research Africa uh, conference that was organized by the Bit School of Arts. So that gives you a little bit of um, Molemo's uh, background. Molemo, thanks very much for joining us. Sibongile is a colleague at the uh, Witt School of Arts, a colleague of mine at the Witt School of Arts. She's a lecturer in the Department of Drama for Life um, at the Witt School of Arts. At the moment, she teaches on the postgraduate certificate in education um, course. So she works with students who are qualifying as secondary school uh, art teachers, particularly drama teachers. Um, in the Drama for Life department, she also uh, lectures in applied drama and theatre with a specific focus on um, work that is related to the theatre of the oppressed. And I'm hoping that that will come through in her presentation today. She's also taught in Zimbabwe and has used drama to help address social issues um, amongst youth in, in that country. Um, more recently, Zivongile has been uh, part of the Arm for the Arts um, Winter School Program, where she made a, a very, very striking and I must say very popular presentation. Um, so we're very pleased to, to have Zivongile with us today as well. And then the third panelist is uh, Puleng Plessy, who uh, studied at the University of Johannesburg, um, and also at uh, the Witt School of Arts, where she um, completed her MA in Fine Arts a few years back. Um, she's a director and founder of the Keep the Dream Arts organization. Um, and presently, she's the education officer at the Javit Art Center at the University of Pretoria. She's a member of the Another Roadmap uh, Africa Cluster, a research group. So over the last four or five years, she has been very involved in a whole series of, um, of conferences and symposia that have taken her to, to Zurich, to Vienna, and to various other parts of um, Europe and the African continent. She's also worked at the Witz Art Museum, and worked on the education program. Um, Puleng, I'm not going to speak to your research interests because I think that uh, you will probably speak to that during your presentation. Um, I certainly hope that that comes up. And uh, again, I'm very, very pleased to have you part of this, uh, of this panel as well. So to the audience, those are the, um, the three panelists. We've asked them to, to speak for about seven minutes each um, on the, the topic for this, this session, education art, art education across South Africa. Um, once seven minutes is up, I will uh, move us on to the next speaker and um, we'll follow the format of the hour as uh, I described earlier. So again, uh, welcome to all of you. I hope that um, 
There'll be an opportunity for questions and for discussion and responses from the panel. But what I'd like to do now is to hand over to Mulemo and to ask her to speak. Mulemo, thanks very much. Thank you, David, um, and thank you for the introduction. Thank you also to the Turbine Art Bear for enabling the platform for this conversation. Um, I think I will kind of start off really just by kind of offering some thoughts um, in terms of my own thinking and understanding around um, the question of arts education um, and kind of just sort of offer those up. Um, and then sort of as the conversation sort of expands, maybe that will become a little bit more focused. Um, but as David introduced, um, I, I have kind of worked within an arts education space, um, primarily in um, the kind of post-schooling space. So Market Photo Workshop being a photography education institution and then lecturing also at the university. Um, and then I've also done um, a bit of work around kind of um, education of artists outside of formal education spaces with my work at Vansler, particularly thinking about what are the kinds of ongoing learning spaces that artists have access to um, post their kind of formal education. Um, but actually what I am going to kind of um, focus my uh, seven minutes on today is um, a completely different space of education that I have worked in for some years which is adult education and adult literacy. Um, and I, I bring that in because I think it's really informed quite significantly the way I think about education. Um, so I have been involved with a sort of a volunteer adult literacy program for about the last 12 years um, and have led it with my partner for maybe the last 10. Um, and the program works primarily um, with domestic workers, uh, started off very much as a kind of English reading and writing literacy program, uh, but we've shifted it quite a lot over the years to also engage with issues of, for example, um, law literacy, looking at um, labor law, family law, um, financial literacy, uh, uh, sort of basic health, particularly looking at women's health. Most of the students are in their, women in their 50s and 60s, a few men. Um, all working in kind of domestic labor of some form. Um, and uh, it's been probably the most informative sort of education space for me, particularly in the sense of thinking about education not simply as a kind of um, upskilling or career oriented kind of training, um, but thinking about ideas of lifelong, le lifelong learning and the role of learning in kind of um, human humanness. And I think that particularly for something like arts education, um, this becomes a space that I think needs a bit more engagement. Um, often I think the kind of art education conversation gets quite caught up in some of the kind of STEM versus STEAM concerns, um, particularly in South Africa, the concerns around the extent to which um, and sort of schools that are not private or former Model C offer um, arts education and these kinds of debates, which of course are very important. Um, but as, as kind of the world shifts and questions around labour shift and the kinds of um, work worlds that young people are going to be moving into, um, shift to a space not necessarily of kind of um, direct technical skill, but much more in terms of ideas of kind of critical thinking, um, problem solving, um, kind of being able to, and this is a phrase I use often, I'm not sure how helpful it is, but think upside down, which is something that I think um, art education really help, like um, equips people with, um, becomes really interesting for me. And um, the, the ideas of kind of thinking about lifelong learning and thinking about the ways in which people continue to um, expand their capacities, challenge themselves, um, become individuals in, more in their fullness through education, I think is um, really vital in thinking about this. Uh, so so with, the, with the students that I um, facilitate in the Adult Literacy Programme, being often in their 60s, they're not training for the purposes of like a big career change um, or for a metric even, because many of them don't necessarily have that. Um, but return every week for something else. And I'm really interested in what, what that something else is. 
um, and um, in, in, in the kind of facilitatory processes of that adult education program, I think my own sort of cultural and creative training really informs um, the ways in which we operate in the classroom. So very much from a kind of um, peer learning, peer education, um, kind of uh, my role is much more as facilitator than teacher. Um, I bring into the space other individuals, other forms of knowledge, uh, resources that maybe are not accessible. Um, and then as a group, we kind of work through those resources and the students are very clear and particular about the kinds of things that they want to learn. They drive their own learning. Um, and I think that's very much informed by my kind of creative work. Um, I'm not sure how much more time I have, but I thought to just give a very basic example of how this might operate um, more specifically within our sector. Um, and that's, sorry, David, your silence, how many minutes that? I said, please go ahead. Okay, cool. Um, so the example that I wanted to bring forward was actually something from the Visual Arts Network of South Africa, uh, which was a program that I, um, together with Ashley Whitfield, initiated some years ago, which was um, uh, called Winter School. And it was kind of framed around a sort of almost like a night school program um, and was aimed at the fact that there's an, a major gap in further education for artists post your formal education. So there aren't really spaces where you can continue to learn and continue to explore in collective ways. Um, and, and kind of um, through this kind of idea of the individual artist, we haven't really created spaces where artists can come together and learn together. And, and that's really what Winter School tried to address. Winter School was held in a uh, restaurant that sold food primarily to workers during the day. Uh, that wasn't open at night except during winter school, which ran in winter. Um, and so it was a sort of very easily accessible sort of popular site, but also became a site of kind of higher education within a kind of um, mainstream working class environment. Um, but food was also really important to that educational experience and we all ate together after we had someone come and speak to us about a particular theme. Um, and, and that kind of gathering around food, for me, is very much part of the educational experience. Um, and then I think the other thing that was really important was um, that the people who came into the room um, were from various different fields. We rarely dealt with kind of traditionally artistic subjects. And the people who spoke to us were not necessarily experts in the usual sense. Um, and I think that really provided an exciting space for um, rethinking not only what art education can mean, but also rethinking the space of artists and arts training and teaching in the broader education space, in the broader kind of public space. Um, what is it that artists and arts education might offer for um, a wider sense of what it means to make meaning of our place? Um, a wider sense of, to make meaning of kind of key urgencies of our present time, um, which I think the project did in, in really interesting ways by bringing in a range of different people into the room at any given time and exploring conceptually together and then eating together. Um, so that's just one sort of example that kind of speaks to some of the things that I'm, I'm trying to bring forward. Well, Emma, thanks very much. Yeah. Hopefully we'll be able to pick up on some of those really crucial ideas uh, in the latter part of the session. Um, so I think what we'll do now, we'll go directly to Sibon Gile. Um, Sibon Gile, are you uh, able to take up the, the next uh, part of the session? Yes. Yes, I'm, um, I'm ready. Um, hello, everyone. Hello, everyone. Um, I'll first of all give you my experiential background um, in uh, my formal and informal uh, teaching spaces. Like uh, David introduced me as a teacher or a lecturer for the postgraduate certificate of education in uh, drama teaching methodology and arts and culture teaching methodology. Um, so with drama students, they, are, they will be specializing mostly in uh, teaching drama in high school. And then with arts and culture, we see a kind of cross and interdisciplinary approach to the arts where we put music, visual, 
visual arts and drama together and then we teach um grade eight and nine and then for the drama specialization the students will be required to teach uh, grade uh, 10 to grade 12. and i want to say that i want to point out that i've learned a lot from teaching the PGCE students, both the drama specialists and the arts and culture students. That class, especially the class of 2020, I wanna give them a shout out and say, I've learned a lot from you guys as an educator of the arts and particularly drama. Informally, I've worked with uh, young people uh, in Joburg, in Limpopo and other areas in South Africa and women also um through using uh, a, a forum theater method which is located in the theater of the oppressed this method is a socio-educational tool that helps communities in their societies and in their um in their uh, in, in their societies to educate themselves to free themselves from the big demands and terrible demands of this world we know what the world has come up to be. And so I always feel that the theater of the oppressed is one of those tools that has enabled me and enabled a lot of communities to understand the value of arts education. So I'm that kind of person who has experienced formal education in the classroom and was also experienced in formal uh, arts education outside the classroom. And so my talk is actually going to be focusing on that and the lessons that I have learned in both these fields. And this has all been grounded uh, from what I, I learned at Drama for Life. Drama for Life is an organization, an academic organization, if I can put it that way, that integrates art, art therapies, activism, development, and education contexts. So you can see the interdisciplinary work, but my passion, my passion lies mostly in the education and social change contexts. So this is what I've learned from uh, the field about drama and art education. I've learned that drama is the most concrete of art forms. I'm sorry, I've got my visual art friends here and I know they're music people, but believe me, I'm going to speak mostly about drama as the most concrete of art forms. And what do I mean that by that? Um, I mean that I've learned how drama can be the core and can be at the core of the school curriculum for both its poetic and functional use. In the drama and teaching experience, exploration and adventure are created between the lecturer, students, and the content, such that personal knowing is established in relation to the objective world. So what we are saying, education should make the individual grow, and arts education does that, so that whoever receives arts education should have that kind of personal knowing so that the individual grows in this terrible world. And I'm going to put terrible in, in quotes and you'll understand why. Um, so um, the world, arts education becomes a dialect set up, a dialectic set up between personal knowledge and social objectivity. Drama as a concrete art form creates a world that is known by critical pedagogues as a dialectical thought where the world is questioned and considers all possibilities that enable society and all institutions to live a constructive life. This is where um, arts educators such as Augusto Bowal of the theater of the oppressed, locate theater and drama and any form of arts, arts education as a rehearsal for life. Meaning that when we look at the way art or drama is taught, it should 
help to create in people that thing that they are dealing with life. Whatever they are seeing on the stage, on the theatrical stage, in the wall, in the theatrical wall, is something that they will learn later and they will do later in their everyday lives. Hence, he says, it's a, revol- it's a rehearsal for a revolution or a rehearsal for life. And what a way, what an approach to the education of life and to the, educa- and to the freedom people need to experience in the world. Because like I said, the world has become such a terrible world. It's in a terrible state. But arts education as located by Bowal should do that magical kind of approach to our lives. But then now as arts educators, we speak of um, pedagogy or as general teachers or educators, we teach pedagogy. But my question is, what is the pedagogical reasoning behind art education, especially in the South African context, considering the social, political, cultural, and economic landscape, and even the framework of South Africa or the South African um, uh, uh, curriculum? I will start with the assumption that most teaching and learning is initiated by some form of text, We expect our learners to use the textbook. We expect them to have a syllabus. We expect them to write tests. We expect them to do a lot of things. So at the end of the day, both the student and the teacher wish to have accomplished something from the arts education. But what makes that text uh, of art education successful and unique? And I'm going to underline the word unique. People, we are unique educators. Arts educators are unique people. So what is this pedagogical reasoning behind our uniqueness, behind our unique arts education? For me, is that we get our students and learners to comprehend the content we teach, how we instruct them, how we help them reflect on their lives and what they are being taught. And ultimately, how do they transform their lives? And I believe that it is through us getting um, an education that is tailored and adapted to student needs. And what is this? These are motivations that we need to put across to our students. How do we motivate our students? Do we understand their social class in South Africa? Do we understand gender? There's so much gender-based violence that is happening in South Africa. So does arts education, be it in visual arts, be it in, in drama, be it in music, are we putting that into our syllabus? Are we putting that into our, uh, into our curriculum so that this text is understood? Very important that we include that. Age. Who are we teaching? For example, I said I've worked with young people and I've worked with older women. So as an arts educator, what text do I bring through my arts education, through the drama teaching that I do, through the theater of the oppressed that I use for for these age groups to understand what is happening in the world? What, What is their interest? Do we tap into their interest? Do we help them for uh, self-conception so that at the end of the day, we can say and and clearly claim that, yes, we've built a group of people who are becoming um, people with aptitude in their lives, right? So for us to uh, achieve that kind of pedagogical uh, reasoning, we need a pedagogical action. So what is this pedagogical action that will make us empower the people that we say we are teaching through our education? And especially in the circumstances in South Africa. I believe that first of all, we need to understand the school uh, settings. For example, the location, where are our schools located such that we are able to teach the arts? Is it in the townships? Is it in the suburbs? Is it in the CPD? All these places have a need. Are we aware of that need? 
still under school setting. Do, are these private schools? Are these public schools? And you will notice that there are discrepancies between the way we teach arts education in private schools and in public schools. I will give an example from when I visited my students last year when they were doing their teaching experience or teaching practice in schools. Students, the uh, student teachers who taught in private schools fared better than the students that taught in public schools. And do you know why? It is because of the pedagogy in the classroom management. In private schools, they are art studios and their theaters where learners can practice drama properly. They can do their artwork properly. But I discovered that in public schools, maybe as an example in Soweto, it's just a classroom with desks and chairs and there is no theater. So what happens? Are we achieving our pedagogical reasoning when that is happening? Do we have technological facilities that are used by the age of millennia? And another thing is that is the comprehension of the subjects, the art subjects that are being taught. An example is you go to a school and you find an English teacher or an, or an LO teacher teaching drama. What does that mean for us? Is that fair? Do they really comprehend the teaching of arts? Do they really comprehend the teaching of uh, drama? Another action is understanding pupils' attitudes and feelings in the learning of, uh, of drama. Do we understand that our learners bring with them experiential knowledge and background, which should be tapped into, especially when it comes to cultural subjects like the arts. We need to understand that. Do we understand the value or the importance of creativity in problem solving? And with this, I think with arts teachers, that is clearly understood. As I'm sorry to say this, if they are maths teachers or science teachers or other teachers, I don't see and usually feel the importance that they attach to uh, creativity in solving problems that we see in drama and that we see also in other arts subjects. So, and another thing is that um, with people's uh, attitudes and learning, do art teachers um, stimulate uh, pupils' interest and do they give them motivation for learning for them to be self-reflective in this world at the end of the day. I hope um, really we understand the importance of pedagogical action um, around school setting, classroom management, pupils' attitude, so that we can clearly and, and, say, and claim that we really are arts educators. So Ibongi, what should we do? Yes. Can you close in two minutes? Okay, okay. Thank you. So um, arts teachers should know that the arts teaching project is about uh, developing students' powers of self-expression, self-awareness, self-confidence, and encouraging self sensitivities and powers of imagination that may not be otherwise present in the rest of the school curriculum. So philosophically, drama and other arts subjects are much more of a general power movement in education. So the essential task is for us to develop a framework of ideas, a rationale for arts teaching, where arts teachers can explore and develop a dialectical approach to teaching and learning. And then my experiences uh, in arts education in the region, and especially with Zimbabwe, is that political influences come into the fray. It's about who is in power, and where do their interests lie? For example, when I did my teacher training, I did a, a thesis on using drama to teach comprehension skills in English and Isindevel. Believe you me, there was no textbook to help me, but I just felt that the method of drama or drama can be used as a very good method for teaching other subjects across the curriculum. 
even right now, currently in Zimbabwe, yes, they've introduced uh, drama teaching or arts teaching um, in, the, in, the, in, in the primary schools. But let me tell you, there aren't even any textbooks. So teachers are just teaching that from the top of their heads. And that is not fair. So to conclude, I would say the view of drama and arts in education is core to the real business of all academic institutions. It should encourage schools to make sense of the com complexities of the world around us. True gut level arts pedagogy has to do with what you at your deepest level would want to know about humanity in the classroom and outside of it. So ladies and gentlemen, for me, my blueprint is that teaching is my calling and drama is my question. Thank you. Ibongile, thanks very much. I hope we'll have time to get back to some of those points that you made. I see Jordan has uh, written in the chat that you've been raising some really, really valid points. And uh, I think we all agree with that wholeheartedly. Um, Thank you. So hopefully we'll be able to get back to, to some of those ideas. Thanks again, Sibongile. Puleng, can we hand David. over to you? Yes, absolutely. Um, hello to everyone. So I just want to um, speak quickly about what my research interests are, which um, they actually explore the notion of facilitation, facilitating through dialogue to improve pedagogy by localizing content and introducing different Isuzulu term terminologies to reimagine language and practices associated with, um, with art education. So, David, Davida, actually. <laughs> with that being said, like, um, I, I really want to um, speak to the idea of today um, and the, the, the subject you brought to us today. And I'm thinking whether one looks at uh, arts education, education in the arts, um, arts education, or whether this is in formal, non-formal or informal sectors, whether it is targeted at youth, um, ECD, young adults, teens, children, senior citizens, or whether it's even inter uh, intergenerational. I think there's just two main things that one needs to consider. The first one is that is the pedagogy, and I'm glad Spongile touched on that. And the second one is the idea that we need to localize content. So with uh, when one looks at uh, the first one, which is pedagogy, I'm reminded of Paulo Freire. By the way, Spongile, that is uh, Augustus Boal's Boal's Binge. <laughs> Um, so uh, Paulo Freire really speaks to two ideas of pedagogy. And the first one is the banking concept of education, um, where he really speaks to the idea of um, how the teacher starts to be authoritarian. The teacher teaches and the students are taught, uh, how the teacher knows everything and the, the, the students do, basically do not know anything how it's just this uh, relationship where the teacher talks and they just listen. She is the she, she or he is the subject and they are just mere objects. And that is the banking concept of, idea, of education, which really is the whole idea of depositing knowledge into a student. And then he speaks about the problem posing um, uh, uh, educa concept of education, where somehow there becomes this beautiful merge of the teacher and the students or the students of the teacher and they merge and really they both uh, start to be in this process of learning together in the process. So um, uh, this is when I'm actually going to go into my second point because then we, I'm sure some of us already know that um, Paulo Freire is uh, um, a Brazilian philosopher and I started to think about how one can begin to localize content within the South African content, um, localize a content within the South African content and think about how or which organizations and projects are already starting to do this locally in South Africa. And I'm gonna start by speaking to the Another Roadmap Africa Cluster Johannesburg Working Group. 
Thank you, David. I'm sure you spoke about how um, uh, spoke about this in the introduction about how we're part of this. But I want to speak to two specific projects that really speak to the idea of access, participation, layered disciplines, sensory experiences, as well as open-ended outcomes. So um, the first one is we have uh, this um, traveling suitcase. And the idea of the traveling suitcase really comes from the um, idea of uh, the Medio Art Ensemble, which is a group of cultural activists who fled to exile in Botswana in, during, the, during 1977. Now, in this process, they had uh, a traveling suitcase which had silk screen materials, and this, uh, which allowed for them to do protest posters. Now, the idea of the Johannesburg Working Group was how does one begin to use that um, to, to start uh, um, as, as a project that one can do? And what the Johannesburg Working Group did is that we started to create our own traveling suitcase, which allowed for the traveling of these materials and further workshops that could be done in different spaces. We've had about seven activations both locally and internationally. And it allowed for some form of engagement um, and participation with participants. Now, the second one is the unchronological timeline. So this is a 30 meter timeline. And it was first used to map out the history of arts education in South Africa chronologically. Um, but then it started by, um, then we started by allowing some of the members from another roadmap, uh, Africa Cluster, and the general public um, in the, the, the education department at the WITS, um, uh, WITS education department. And what started to happen um, in, in many of the iterations is how this, this object started to, to change, how this object in the, in more, in the more iterations we had, it started to change and, and, and have um, things beginning to happen. We had poetry sessions, the moments where we allowed for music, art, and even personal narrative to be fit into this, what, would, what one would call what it started off as quite a, a chronological flat information uh, surface, um, allowing that it, uh, in, in engagement and um, uh, uh, participation from our audiences or rather participants. And I, I would say, this is similar to what is currently happening with, uh, this is an example of, of what one could, uh, <laughs> this is a very good example of how one could see art education as mobile, accessible, participatory, how they, it also begins to have layered disciplines. I know Simone you know, is speaking about how, okay, uh, um, drama, visual arts, but how, how those moments starts to be uh, transdisciplinary, how there's then the sensory experience of uh, um, an open-ended outcome. So the reason why I say open-ended outcome is because still um, this, this object uh, continues to, 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 to allow information and allow for knowledge to be inserted, which is, does not come from what Paulo Freire calls as the banking system, but actually it's allowed, uh, it's information that is brought to, to everyone, all the participants. And I think this is, this is also something that one can see in many organizations such as Gelegetla Library uh, with their Lipepe um, uh, gatherings, their mobile library and Keep the Dream, an organization that I run with their interdisciplinary concepts, with language, with terminologies, the idea of reinterpreting artworks, unpacking content, organizations such as Nothing Gets Organized, um, uh, Alphabet Zoo, Danger Havar Ngozi. So these are all these moments where one really starts to see what, what, how can we begin to localize content or local use moments um, from this where we, we begin to, to have these conversations um, around pedagogy and localizing content. Yeah, that's it from me. <laughs> Davita, are you gone? <laughs> Has he disappeared? <laughs>
I, I think David did mention that there may be a little, some few um, network problems. No chilling. Pulen, can you hear me now? Yes, thank you for joining us. I am still here, um, but there's something wrong with my camera. Lauren is communicating with me all the time, trying to get it back on, but uh, I haven't succeeded. So I'm going to continue to speak, given that um, we have 14 minutes left for the session. Just to say thank you to Chantel for her comment on uh, Sibongela's presentation, just, just noting the passion that is so present in um, that was so present in Sibongile's uh, presentation, and how that was so inspirational. And um, Erica, your comments as well um, in relation to what uh, Molema was saying earlier, and uh, also to what uh, Puleng has just presented. Um, I see Carolyn is, has asked a question. And I'm expecting that this is a, a question specifically pulling. So I'm going to um, ask uh, Puleng if, if you can give an example. So this is what Karen has asked. If you can give an example of what you're talking about from an art gallery. I hope, Carolyn, that is adequate uh, representation gallery. of your, your question. But Pauline, given your um, experience, I think, in a number of, of different uh, um, art galleries and museums, if it's Art Museum, also at the, the Javits, um, can you give us an example? Yes, I can, David. In fact, um, at the Javits Art Centre, we are starting to really think critically about um, storytelling moments. That goes back to my localising content. We're thinking about storytelling moments, which is what I would call in Ganyagwane, as well as language. So um, for the Mother Tongue International Day, what we did on that day is for the whole day, of, um, up from eight to, to five, in each hour, we offered a tour in all, um, not all, in most of the African of in most of the South African um, uh, indigenous languages. So I think that's how one begins to use it in a, in a museum context. And the way in which this was facilitated is that it allowed for engagement. So we don't just throw information or knowledge feed. We first start by asking questions, allowing us to actually acknowledge that there could be someone who we are taking a tour with who has actually much more knowledge and information about things that we know. So it's already coming into the museum context or coming into a tour, understanding that um, the, 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 the viewer as well as the tour guide are actually also in this um, teacher-student relationship where we merge and we, we kind of have, um, I, I don't want to use the word equal, but there's, there's this merge <laughs> that begins to happen. So I think that's an example of how it could work in a museum context. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, like, thanks again for that, that example. Um, as always, a very, very rich example. Um, and I know that you have many, many others given your experiences over the last five, six years. Um, I see there's another question from uh, Richard Kilpert. And Richard asks, how can we increase the visibility of South African practic practicing artists in popular culture? And I would expect Richard is asking about that in, in relation to the range of different um, areas of, of arts education. I think one of the really uh, amazing things about this discussion is how it's covered um, adult education, teacher training um, for young people wanting to be arts educators, contexts for, for younger learners. Um, so I think that what Richard's asking is how can we, how can we increase the visibility of arts, of South African practicing artists in, in all of this? Um, and perhaps outside um, of the, the the kind of things that one would normally find in um, the the curriculum. 
Um, I see Richard made another comment. Um, so I'm going to look at the uh, Imbali online book launch last week. Um, there's a call to start a youth wing, um, just to activate the creative fields uh, in schools. Okay, so that's a suggestion. But um, should we try and go back to uh, Richard's question? How do we increase the visibility of South African practicing artists and what we're doing in arts education? Mulema, would you like to, to take that up? Yeah, I, I can take a stab at it. I mean, I think um, my own opinion of this may not be so um, positive, but um, I think artists are not very good at being able to communicate really what we do um, and have kind of um, maybe gotten a little bit into that. And I think part of what um, both Puleng and um, Spongile have kind of raised is how central, in fact, creative practice can be to everything else. No? I mean, Spongy was talking about theater, and we'll, we'll let you take theater as the core of <laughs> um, school education. Um, and I think we struggle to articulate that. I think we, we struggle to articulate um, the roles that we can play and the roles that we do play. One of the things that's obviously emerged a lot since the, the lockdowns is the extent to which um, creatives have been so central to kind of surviving lockdown and yet that doesn't necessarily play out in, in how a lot of the support systems um, uh, that emerged out of, of lockdown, um, you know, in terms of sort of what resources were distributed, it doesn't really match the extent to which creatives um, were, were producing content and enabling kind of some level of sanity. Um, and I, I think that's our problem and I think we need to get better at that. Um, and I, I, I think um, it's also about the ways in which our industry is kind of, particularly in the contemporary arts, um, developed into something that tries to be quite um, um, uh, sort of uh, far away from basic understanding and some kind of highfalutin sort of approach. Um, and I think there, there are many people doing quite interesting things about, about how to shift that. And of course, I think um, having young people access arts access spaces like Javits in the way that Boulain is doing early on already start to break down some of those barriers. Um, but we also, I think, need to learn to navigate what it means to be um, popular to some degree and the, all the complexities that comes with is how do we introduce nuance, criticality, um, intellectual debates in ways that are accessible and engaging rather than creating sort of just a painting on a wall and expecting people to, to find a way into that. That would be my initial thoughts. Oliver, thank you. Again, I see time is against us. We've got about six minutes left. So I think it's, we're going to go to uh, a think, really important question that has been asked of Sibon Kile from Sunil uh, Siwe. Um, thanks for your comments and the questions you put to us, that you put to the panel. But this is particularly for Sibongile. The Sibongile is Okay, okay. Sanelisio, thank you for that question. And because that has also been one of my concerns, and especially when I gave the example of uh, the, the discrepancies between private and public schools. And I'm glad that you're bringing in the issue of even rural public schools. Because of the nature of funding the arts, it's, 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 it's not working. But one thing that I like about um, drama in particular, as explained by people like Augusto Boal and other people and other authors and practitioners who deal with what is called a theater for development, they understand that because of funding problems and especially in Africa and South Africa being included, there is not much that can be done within these uh, resources that are available. So what happens is that because drama has to deal with social issues, things that happen every day in people's lives, sometimes 
some resources may not be necessarily um, needed. What we can do is that we can absorb what nature has provided with us. An example is when you are running a theater of the oppressed workshop or showing a theater of the oppressed uh, show, you can do it under a tree in the uh, in the chief's uh, homestead you don't need a special wall to do that but at the end of the day you're saying that we want to educate people through the arts so that they deal with their lives i'm not saying that we we don't need resources technological resources we do not need walls theater, uh, theater walls we do need them but let us also learn to use what is available for us. I'll give an example of um, a, a, a Kenya project when Guki Wationg and Guki Wamisere were involved. They worked with the rural community. That is where Nguki Wationgo started writing about decolonizing the mind. They worked with the, with the community members to build um, a theater hall for themselves. The actors themselves came from the community. And the community also tried to raise funds and whatever resources they needed to, uh, to fight against the injustices that Kenya was experiencing. And believe me, the, the hall was made of mud, it was made of grass, and it was made of tree branches that were there. And you know what? The project was such a success, but we still are a long way in getting funding that will cut across, across the class divide. And I think we have to keep pushing and pestering ministers and the Ministry of Arts and Culture. It's happening in Zimbabwe, not so much funding is uh, given to them. It's happening in Kenya, not so much funding is given to them. But maybe as people, maybe from academic institutions, we should also write papers that provoke and motivate for more project funding for arts education right across. I hope you answered, Sunny. Tibogila, thanks very much. Thanks very much. Damon, thanks also for your comments. Oops. Liz, um, um, you've asked Sibangela to repeat those writers who speak on creating working without many resources. I think if we can just hold on that and see if we can connect the two of you outside of this um, outside of this forum. Yeah. We're coming up to five yes. when we close. Sibangela, if we can uh, connect you and Liz um, at a later point. Um, okay, no problem. Uh, I think that you know, one of the challenges of uh, the sessions is that there is so much that is raised, really incredible material, um, and we don't have an opportunity to, to take up all the the paths that are opened up by the panelists, but also by the audience and the questions that are asked. All I can say is that there are a number of opportunities to become involved in um, this kind of arts education discussion. I'm for the art uh, organization and I encourage all of you to to consider becoming members because there are regular um, opportunities to engage in, in discussions like this and to, to contribute and to, to really begin to build something. So in that respect, I see what the Turban Art Fair has done uh, today as being part of this much wider um, move to, to place arts education more centrally in what we are, are doing uh, in the art sector. Um, and then also just to pick up on what Richard Kilpert said earlier on about um, the uh, Art Africa in Bali visual literacy um, project uh, publications, there are a whole number of quite incredible um, uh, 
opportunities for us as arts educators to become part of what is becoming increasingly a really vibrant um, network. So I'm going to just, I'm going to stop and close now. Um, as I said, there's so much more that we could discuss. Um, there's so many things that each of the panelist, panelists have um, said that we could pick up on. Um, you know, Mulema, what you, you were saying about how you're using um, arts practices, certainly that's how I understood it. With the, the adult education that you've been involved in, where you've been looking at, at things around law literacy, labor, financial um, literacies, and how um, the practices that you bring in from the arts enable um, the making of meaning, the making of place, and the addressing of, of key urgencies. And you know, I see a very um, key um, overlapping there with what uh, Sibankile was talking about, um, but how um, the presence of drama in, in a whole range of different education environments is about opportunities to question the world um, and ultimately a rehearsal for life, picking up on Augusta Boyle's um, writing, thinking and actions. Um, and then um, thinking about how Puleng has spoken, I think, very, very eloquently about the a whole number of different examples and how um, the, uh, this enables um, us to think more particularly about working with what is in place in various locations and localizing uh, content uh, as, as we continue with a revitalized and a reimagined uh, arts education, if in fact that's what we want to call it. So I'm going to close there. I'm going to thank the panelists, Molemo, Sibon Gile, Puleng, thanks very much. Thanks to the Turbine Art Fair. Thanks to all of you in the audience. Um, and I hope that we'll be able to, to come together um, as often as possible as we use the different fora that are available to us to continue to, to address the challenges and the, the amazing and inspirational work that is taking place uh, in this area, in this country, and uh, beyond the borders of South Africa. So thanks to all of you. Sibongile um, Molemo Pulen, do you want to have a final word for the audience before we close? Sibongile? You're mute, Bungile. Uh, am I? Can you hear me now? Yes. I'm yeah, saying, you, let just, us not for. Just, okay. Yeah. Let us not forget pedagogical reasoning and action in arts education, despite the lack of funding and resources. Thanks, Sibongile. Puleng, a last word from you. Um, I, I would just like to um, really speak to the idea of what Molimo spoke to about uh, bringing food as part of the culture and how dance has also become part of a culture of thinking, like um, another roadmap, Africa Clusters, people who think together, dance together. So I just like to say that there are many ways of thinking about arts education that are not rooted within a rigid structure, but already exist within our community spaces. 
Thanks, Pulang. People who dance together think together. People who think together dance together. <laughs> it's the thinking and the dancing, or vice versa. It's okay. <laughs> Good. Thank you. Mulemo, a last word from you too, please. Um, just a, a huge thank you to um, all three of you for the amazing work that you do um, and to some of the amazing people that I've seen are in the in attending in the session. I think there's a community of extraordinary people really pushing the boundaries of education and really exciting things happening. Um, so I think, who was it? Someone, Richard, said Aluta Continua. And so on we go. Thanks, Mulemo. To the three of you, yes, continue the incredible work that you're doing to those people in the audience that are doing amazing work as well and have been doing so for many years. Let's, let's continue. And again, thanks to the Turbine Art Fair. Thanks, Lauren and Aisha, very much for inviting us. And with that, thank you and good evening.